morning, Bereans. Appreciate you all being here this morning. Um, we're continuing our COVID-19 series. You know, I say that kind of jokingly, but since this started, we've been doing topical messages, and I'm not a huge fan of topical messages. I would rather be going verse by verse to the Scriptures. But I think in the day, in the time, in the circumstance we're in, I think it's helpful. And I'm hearing from you that these messages are helpful. I just want to encourage you in your faith. I want to encourage you in the midst of everything that's going on around us that God is still in control. We're living in a very uncertain, very troubling time right now. We're living in fear. So many people are living in fear of this coronavirus. People are wearing masks. They're wearing gloves. They're not leaving their house. There's a fear that the economy is going to crash if we don't get back to work real soon. But most people are afraid to even go out, and I think that if businesses were to open right now, many people would not even go because they're afraid. Some people are afraid right now, how are we going to survive being out of work? Where are we going to get our money from? There's just a lot of uncertainty right now. We're living in uncertain times. And because of that, many people are living in fear. Now, as I said last week, it's my personal opinion... <laughs> Okay, obviously this doesn't come from the Bible, but it's my opinion that this coronavirus is a bioterrorism attack. I think it was originated, well, actually they say it was originated in North Carolina, then shipped to Wuhan, and our, our little buddy there uh, <coughs> is, is involved in this. Um, yeah, I think it was purposely released to the public. I think they're trying to just do all they can to destroy Donald Trump. General Milley, the chairman, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he's looking into this, that this actually came from the Wuhan lab, that this is a bio, bioterrorism attack. I really do think it's, like I said, a plan of the deep state to ruin the economy. And here's the, here's the biggest thing that's causing fear, people. It's the lamestream media. They're pushing fear in every possible way that they can. They want you to be afraid. And it's working. They want us to be afraid so we will listen to the draconian laws that are being put out by some of these governors. They want us afraid so we'll be in control and they can tell us what to do. You know, the average American today thinks it's dangerous to go outside. And they actually, I think, think because of the commercials, because of the propaganda, we're saving lives by staying home. See, if no one goes out, we save a life, and it's worth one life, whatever we have to go through. Really? If you believe that, I need to tell you, you need to stop listening to the lamestream media. Because they're just pushing fear. And if your number one goal is to just save lives, no matter what else has to be destroyed, then you know what we need to do? We need to ban automobiles. They're dangerous. If no one drives... Think how many lives will be saved, right? According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention statistical data, nearly a million and a half people are killed in road crashes every year. On average, this means that approximately 3,700 people die each day in automobile accidents. So if it's all about, we just got to save lives no matter what else, is, then just let's do away with cars. Everybody start walking. But then we got to do away with a lot of other things, because things are dangerous. Life, there's, there's just things that are uncertain, people. That's what life's about. You can't just live in your house, wrapped up in bubble wrap, hoping everything will be all right. That's not living. In an article in Global Research entitled, Stanford Study Publishes COVID-19 Was Overhyped, you think? The article says death rate is likely under 0.2%. And it shows how overhyped this whole thing is. The article states, MIT Tech Review had to admit that the actual death rate is likely under 0.2%, which means this whole thing is about as dangerous as the common flu, which we have every year. The article says studies will continue to emerge proving what many have already known, that COVID-19, the pathogen, is nowhere near the threat we were told in nowhere near justifying COVID-19, the hysteria. 
Again, if nobody had ever said anything about this, this would just go on. Some people would get sick. Uh, yes, some people are dying. That happens every year. People die all the time. A CNN article states this this week. Study finds no benefit. Higher death rate in patients taking hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19. And, and this is just, this is fake news, okay? This is absolutely fake news. They know it, and then this has been repeated over and over by every news media. The article said coronavirus patients taking hydroxychloroquine, a treatment touted by President Trump, of course they got to slam Trump, because Trump said it, it's got to be wrong, were no less likely to need mechanical ventilation and had higher death rates compared to those who did not take the drug, according to a study of hundreds of patients at U.S. Veterans Health Administration Medical Centers. Now, as I said, all the major news medias, this was everywhere. They're pushing this because they love it. It fits their narrative. They're warning us of the dangers of hydroxychloroquine. They want us in fear. They want us to think there's no cure for this virus. Stay away from this stuff. What we need to understand is that this is an absolute bogus study. Renowned French virologist Dr. Didier Raoul wrote, the Department of Veterans Affairs study on the drug hydroxychloroquine was closer to scientific fraud than reasonable analysis. Raoul said 30% of the patients in the supposed control group were given the antibiotic erythromycin, which is being used to treat the coronavirus, while nearly dying patients with, lympho with lymphopoeia were treated with hydro hydroxychloroquine. Now, Rao released his own study on hydroxychloroquine and erythromycin uh, just a few weeks ago, and he said it demonstrates 91% effectiveness in more than 1,000 patients with zero side effects. This drug has been used for 65, 70 years. It's safe, and it cures things besides COVID-19. So they don't want us to know about this. Now, here's what's interesting, because, you know, you got a virologist coming out and saying, this study is fake, it's no good. Well, the Secretary of Veteran Affairs, Robert Wilkie, also threw cold water on the media hysteria on Wednesday by noting this. The VA study was an observational study, not a clinical study. He goes on to say, it was done on a small number of veterans, sadly those of whom were in the last stages of life. So they're going to do a study. They get the people that are dying right now, give them some hydroxychloroquine. They didn't give any zinc, which is important to give zinc with this. They didn't do that, and these people died. So they say, we got a study here. He goes on to say, we know that the drug has been working. We know that. Now, middle-aged and young veterans, he said, and the governor of New York was just at the Oval Office yesterday asking for more of the drug to be delivered to the city of New York. So if it wasn't working, they wouldn't want it. They want the drug because it is working. That's clear. But the media is trying to keep us afraid. Again, if you're afraid, they can control you. If we discover a cure for this coronavirus, the lockdown ends, the deep state plan fails, we go back to life. And that's why when President Trump mentioned it some time back, they lost their minds. And I'm asking you to please, please be a Berean, do some research that does not involve the lamestream media. And I'm telling you right now, if you Google any of this stuff, you're going to get nothing but lamestream media. You won't get to the truth at all. It's just amazing. They own all these search engines, okay? They're pushing to the public what they want them to know. Believers, you can live in fear, which will paralyze you, or you can live in faith, trusting God. That's a choice we all have to make. We need to learn to trust God in everything that happens. We've been talking about that. We've been talking about the sovereignty of God. Now, for a study this morning, I want us to look at the faith of Moses and how, by his faith, he overcame fear. Some things that were really, I think, to be afraid of, he overcame. Hebrews 11 tells us that because of his faith, Moses had the power to rise above the temptation of riches and pleasure of the world. Moses made a conscious choice 
to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That was an act of faith. He actually believed that if he did what God wanted him to do, he'd come out better in the end. Isn't that something amazing? He believed that his eternal reward would be far outweighed by anything the world had to offer. Hebrews 11.26 says, He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. Now for our study this morning, we want to look at how faith can triumph over the fears and terrors of the world. Faith not only elevates the heart above materialistic pull of the world, but it also delivers it from the fear of man. Faith and fear are opposites. And yet, they're often both found dwelling within us. But where one is dominant, the other is dormant. The constant attitude of the Christian should be, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. That should be our constant cry. I will trust. And if I'm trusting, I'm not going to be afraid. But what ought to be and what is are often very different things. We looked last week at David's lapse of faith. 1 Samuel 21.10, he says, And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. David, the giant killer, he's afraid and he's running for his life. Then in Psalm 56, which was written after the incident at Gath, David said this, When I'm afraid, I'll put my trust in you. That's what we need to do, people. When we become afraid, we need to trust in God. You know, we all seem to have that potential to vacillate back and forth between fear and faith. One minute we're afraid, next minute we're trusting God. One day we're trusting in the Lord, the next day we're running in fear. Well, in Hebrews 11, we see Moses standing in faith against incredible opposition. And because of his faith, he had, doesn't have any fear of the king of Egypt. And as we study the faith of Moses, we must remember its context in the book of Hebrews. The author is writing to believers who were becoming discouraged and were ready to give up, just like a lot of people are today. People are discouraged. They're tired of being locked down. They're tired of being told where they can go and can't go. They're, they're tired of not being able to go out and go to a restaurant. So a lot of people are just like frustrated and ready to give up. So he exhorts them to endurance in their Christian lives. Therefore, he says, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Believers, in the midst of trials, a person's faith may waver and may even fail. And hence, the writer's exhortation to endurance. This book is a call to perseverance in the faith, whatever the odds. In Hebrews 10.38, he says, The just shall live by his faith. And whenever we fear, we are not living by faith. We are not trusting God when we're living in fear. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is it, people. I will not fear because God is with me. He's not going to forsake me. Our God is omnipresent, which means all of God is everywhere. He cares for His people and He's with them. And as long as we have the promise of His presence, why would we be afraid? He knows the situation. He knows what we're dealing with. Well, let's look at how Moses' faith overcame fear. Hebrews 11.27 says, By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now this verse poses a problem for students of Scripture because Moses left Egypt on two different occasions. And the scholars are divided as to which of them is in view here. Which, which time is he talking about? Was Moses' flight from Egypt after he killed an Egyptian an act of faith? 
Some scholars seem to think so. Well, let's look at Exodus 2, 11. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people, the Israelites, and he looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. So he kills this Egyptian and he buries him. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? And he answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So obviously the word's getting around what Moses did. Then Moses was afraid. And he thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now, if Moses left Egypt in fear, as verse 14 says, how could this be an act of faith? Why would the author of Hebrews select this incident as an example of Moses' trust in God? Some scholars see this 40-year period in Midian as a time of great faith with Moses overcame the temptation to frustration and discouragement as he waited on God. But I think what we see in Exodus 4 might contradict that view. Look at Exodus 4, 21-26. And Yahweh said to Moses, all right, let me just make a comment here on the word Lord there in all caps. You hear me, I don't read the Lord, I read Yahweh because that's what that is. That's the yod heh in Hebrew, and it's the name Yahweh. And our Bible has taken out every use of Yahweh and put in Lord. All right, I think God wants us to know His name. He wants us to use His name. So when you see that in all capitals, that is the name of God, Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I'll harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, Israel is my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, Yahweh met him and sought to put him to death. That's referring to Moses. Then Zipporah took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now that's a pretty curious story. Yahweh almost kills Moses. We don't really know how. Maybe it was a disease. We're not really sure. We don't know. But we do know why. The fact that Yahweh says, let him alone in verse 26, shows that his anger was caused by the fact that Moses' son had not been circumcised. The fact that one of Moses' sons was uncircumcised was a sign of disobedience, a transgression in the eyes of God. Genesis 17, 10 and 11 says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Therefore, I don't think that Hebrews eleven twenty seven refers to Moses' flight to Midian, the first time he left Egypt. By contrast, after Moses had waited 40 years in Midian, God called him and spoke to him from the burning bush. So he's been in Midian 40 years. God comes to Moses and he calls him. Exodus 3, 1 and 2. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So that would get your attention. Here's a bush on fire, it's just burning and nothing's happening. Well, we drop down to verse 9. It says, and now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. God is speaking. I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God's saying, I'm going to send you, Moses, to Pharaoh. Now, he left Egypt in fear of Pharaoh, 
He's been in, in the wilderness for 40 years now. Uh, this is an assignment that would really take some faith. Because Moses repeatedly objected until Yahweh reassured him that the elders of Israel would listen to him. He tells him that in verse 18. That he would make the Egyptians favorably disposed to the Israelite, verse 21. That Moses would perform miracles, chapter 4, 1 through 9. And that Moses' brother Aaron would accompany him, verses 14 through 16. So after receiving all these instructions, after God continually said, I'll take care of that, I'll take care of this, Moses' faith finally is strengthened enough that he's not afraid and he says, okay, I'll do this. And I believe that this entire verse here, verse 27, refers to the confrontation that Moses had with Pharaoh in effort to get the freedom of God's people. That he left Egypt is the culmination of a series of events. One of these events is the institution of the Passover to which the author of Hebrews pays particular attention in verse 28. We'll look at that in a minute. And the clause, not being afraid of the anger of the king, covers that period during the ten plagues, Moses' confrontation of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's pursuit of the Israelites into the Red Sea. So I think that's the idea, that's the left Egypt, that's what he's talking about at that time of the plagues, the Exodus. Now, he says, not being afraid of the anger of the king. That's quite a statement when you consider Moses' task. He's to enter the presence of Pharaoh, and he says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went, and he said to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, for 40 years, Moses had been a shepherd in Midian. And now, with no army with basically no backup, he goes before Pharaoh and demands this haughty monarch who literally thought he was God, all right, the Pharaohs viewed themselves as God, he's, he's ruling over one of the greatest empires at the time, and he has to go to him and confront him. I think that kind of task calls for a lot of faith. Moses didn't get a warm reception when he showed up there. Exodus 5.2 says, but Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. So not only does the king refuse their requests, but he makes life more difficult for the children of Israel. Exodus 5 7, it says, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifices to God. So he's saying, listen, let's make it worse. You used, we used to give you straw, we're not anymore. You go get your own straw, but you have to keep making as many bricks as you have been making. So he's just making life more miserable for them. So, you know, as the Israelites come to Moses, they're not too happy with him because of this. And they say this to Moses. They said to him, Yahweh, look on you and judge. The Israelite leaders are talking to Moses. Because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. These leaders are calling down the judgment of God on Moses and Aaron. Isn't this amazing? When the people you're trying to help turn against you, I think it takes a strong faith to keep on going. And if we would apply this today to our current president, I don't know how he gets up in the morning. I don't know how he keeps on going when he gets nothing but hatred from everybody. And he's trying to help the American people. But yet he gets nothing but hatred. Well, Moses begins to confront Pharaoh with the judgments of God. And this took a lot of faith to be continually going into Pharaoh, causing him grief. This guy's a powerful ruler. Humanly speaking, all Pharaoh had to do was order his officers and Moses would have been seized, beaten, tortured, or murdered. And yet Moses was not afraid of the anger of the king. After the ninth plague, Pharaoh called for Moses and proposed a compromise, which Moses refused. And Moses said, Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. So Moses is not afraid. 
He's not afraid of the king, so he announces the final plague. So Moses said, thus says Yahweh, about midnight, I'll go out in the midst of Egypt. Every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl, who is behind the handmill, And all firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land. Every firstborn in the land is going to die. He goes on, Of Egypt such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that Yahweh makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Now how would you like to stand before a king? And it's, I think it's probably hard for us to understand that because we don't have kings. Kings have absolute authority. They can be, do just about anything they want to do because they're king. So how would you like to stand before a king and threaten the death of his son? You know, most people don't take too well the threats, especially people in power. And you're threatening the death of his son. Think about that. Moses, he just goes to him and he confronts him. You know, most of us are even afraid to share our faith because of how people might respond. Ah, they might say something to us. They might reject us. They might want. But here, Moses walks into the king and he says, you're going to lose your firstborn son if you don't listen to us. Look at a couple examples of how fear affects us. In John chapter 12, it says, Nevertheless, many of the authorities, these are leaders in Israel, believed in Him. In other words, they trusted Christ. These leaders in Israel, they trusted Christ. They've heard the gospel. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they trusted Christ, but they're not saying anything. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They wouldn't confess Christ because they were afraid they would lose favor with the people. I think the greatest pressure that Christians face in many cases is the pressure of fear. And the reason most Christians are like the Arctic River, frozen over at the mouth, and don't really communicate their faith, is because they're afraid. They're afraid of losing popularity. They're afraid of not being accepted. Afraid of being put out and people not welcoming them because where they stand. Fear and faith, people are opposites. And whenever you're afraid, it's because you're not trusting God. Look at Numbers 13, 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. That Caleb and this 12 spies went into the land to spy it out. It was a great land, a land that God had promised them. And they're just, they come back with this report. Let us go up at once and occupy it, Caleb says, for we're well able to overcome it. He's positive. He said, let's go. God's given us the land. Let's go get it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people. They're bringing a negative report. They're stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. <laughs> How did they know what they seemed like to them? All right, We're like grasshoppers. That would be a really, really huge difference in height there. Okay, That's kind of an exaggeration, I would say. These people in the land would have to be like 300 feet tall. All right? They're exaggerating their problems. But they're giants, so they're afraid. We can't do that. Listen, God has promised them the land. Look at all they've already seen God do, and yet, no, we just can't trust them. We're afraid. We go to chapter 14 and it says, Yahweh delights in us, as Caleb is talking. He'll bring us into this land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. In other words, it's a great land. This land God promised only do not rebel against Yahweh. Do not fear the people of the land. That was the problem. They were afraid. 
for they, were, they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and Yahweh is with us. Man, if God's with you, why are you afraid? Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. We've got to kill them. No, he says, don't fear those people because we have Yahweh on our side. We don't need to fear. We don't need to fear at all. He says, but the glory of Yahweh appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And Yahweh said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I've done among them. After everything he's done, how long will they not believe? Because these rulers weren't trusting God, they feared the people. In John chapter 12, they were afraid. We see in scriptures that David was afraid of Absalom, his son, and he ran because of it, because he wasn't trusting God. Remember the disciples in the boat with the Lord? They're afraid. The sea's kicking up, they're in a storm, they're afraid, and Yeshua asked them, where's your faith? Because that's what overcomes fear. Peter was afraid, and so he denies Yeshua three times. Believer, fear is a very destructive thing. And when we are afraid, we're not trusting God. So if you're experiencing fear, if you're afraid of something, you're not trusting. I think one of the things we see believers afraid of is to confront other believers who are in sin because we're just afraid of how they'll respond. We know the right thing to do, yet we just don't do it. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, and 6. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, it's not a suggestion, it's a command, in the name of the Lord Yeshua the Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the traditions you receive from us. So he's writing to Thessalonians and he says, listen, I'm commanding you, You need to stay away. You need to not be fellowshipping with Christians who are walking in idleness, in sin. They're not doing what they've been commanded to do. When you continue to fellowship and hang out with them, then they feel what they're doing is all right, and they keep on doing it. I know this is a strange subject. Church doesn't talk about this anymore, but let me just bring it up anyway, okay? 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter... Take note of that person and have nothing to do with them. Again, separate from these believers who are not living in obedience. Why? That he may be ashamed. Now watch, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him like a brother. Okay? 1 Corinthians 5.11 Now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or an idolater, reveler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Eating together with them is a picture of fellowship. He says, listen, if the believers are living in sin, we are not to fellowship with them, we're not to be eating with them, we're not to be socializing with them, because that gives an okay to what they're doing. And we need to do the opposite. Now, if we're honest, we'll admit that fear often keeps us from doing this. Well, I don't know, you know, they're not going to like it if I do that or what, whatever. I mean, I had an experience in one of the first churches I went to where there was a couple that was living in sin. I mean, she had a boyfriend. And I went to the elders of the church and talked to them about it. And they were like, oh, I don't, just don't think we should get involved. Like, what in the world? Sin is in the church and you don't think you should get involved. I mean, it wasn't some casual thing. It was very clear. Well, in Moses' case, no matter what the king said or did, Moses just didn't have any fear. And I think he gives us a lesson on faith. Strong faith doesn't fold under pressure. Why? Well, Moses didn't fold because it says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's a pretty cool saying, I think. In other words, he knew he had an invisible means of support. He knew that no matter what happened, whatever he faced, he would be held up and strengthened because God was there. The word endured here is from the Greek word kotereo, and it means to be strong, steadfast. Moses' strength 
came from seeing him who is invisible. That's an oxymoron. How do you see the invisible? Well, what this is referring to is that Moses practiced the presence of God. Moses' focus was on the king of kings, not on the king of Egypt. In the Tanakh, we see a good, it has a good deal to say about Moses and Moses' relationship with Yahweh. Exodus 33.11 says, Thus Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now the word face here is used in a theological sense with regard to the person and presence of God. Sometimes face is translated as presence. That Moses didn't physically see God is clear, I think, from Exodus 33.20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see my face and live. So although Yahweh showed himself to Moses in some kind of form, some manifestation, he's not appearing in his glory, is what he's telling us. He's appearing in a mode that, that human weakness can bear. He's seeing him, but not in the, in the glory of God. He can't see the glory of God and live. And he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth. Clearly and not in riddles. He beholds the form of Yahweh. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? That's a good question. You know, you know that Moses is tight with God, then you shouldn't be speaking against Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. Now this close walk with God sustained Moses through all the difficult days, through all he had to go through. And if we're going to live a life of faith and not be overcome with fear, we also need to learn to walk in fellowship with God. Now, we've been going over and over this in 1 John. Abiding in Christ, walking in fellowship, living with God. This can only be done as you're spending time in the Word of God. There's no substitute, believer. And if you as a believing Christian are not spending time in the Word of God, why? Do you not want to know your God any better? Do you think you don't need the Word of God? He gave it to us so we could understand who He is, what He wants from us. And as we spend time in the Word and as we submit to the Word of God, we walk in fellowship, in an intimacy with our God. Because, believer, only as we walk in holiness can we really walk in fellowship with God. Because sin blocks our fellowship. Sin hinders our understanding of God. Look at John 14, 21 through 23. Yeshua says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Now, you understand what he's saying here? If you obey my commandments, then you're demonstrating that you love me. So if you don't keep his commandments, what's that demonstrate? You're not loving me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. Yeshua answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. There again, if you love me, you're going to obey me. And my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. This is talking about abiding. This is talking about fellowship. When we walk in obedience to the Lord, he manifests himself to us, and we begin to see him who is invisible. It's talking about fellowship. Intimacy. So Moses, he left Egypt in fear, but he returned in faith as Israel's deliverer. Now as we follow the story of Moses' life, we see that he is constantly growing in faith. And I think that's something we need to understand, believers, that the Scriptures teach that there are degrees of faith. And the more we walk with God, the stronger our faith grows. The more we know His name, the more we can trust in Him. In Matthew uh, 10, 30, 26 through 31, our Lord told his disciples not to fear over and over. He says, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. He tells them in 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, 
Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Believers, we're not to fear man, but we're to fear God. And I think that if we really feared God, we're not going to fear men. As long as God is on our side, we're not worried about what man can do to us. That's a bad translation there, hell, in 1028. Any translation that has hell is a bad translation. Gehenna is the word there. It's not referring to an eternal conscious torment. Matthew 10.29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Some translations say a copper coin. They have other equivalents. But here, he's basically telling us it's, that's a penny. Okay? It, it's not, it, these birds are cheap. Dirt cheap. A penny. And God knows when a bird falls to the ground. Now, what's interesting here is some Greek texts indicate that the word fall may mean hop. So he not only knows when a bird falls, he knows when they hop. In other words, nothing happens in the most insignificant elements of life, even with cheap birds that God doesn't know about, care about, and is absolutely in control of. He says, even the hairs of your head are numbered. You know that the average person has 1,400 hairs on their head. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. 140,000. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most men might, yeah. That might, I mean, you know, okay, some people's less than others, but, you know, 140,000 hairs per head. And it doesn't say that God counts them. It says he numbers them. He actually identifies each hair on your head. What's the point of that? The point is this. If God is concerned about little birds, he's concerned about the hairs on your head, then don't be afraid. Fear not, he says, therefore you are of more value than many sparrows. Believers, we don't need to ever fear. We can never get into a situation that God can't sustain us, he can't carry us through, if we just look to him in faith. And the best way to overcome fear is to cultivate a sense of God's presence. Because fear is the result of distrusting, it's taking your eyes off God, being occupied with the difficulties and troubles. You remember when Peter was walking on the water, he just was all excited about that, you know? Lord, tell me to come to you! And he gets out there and he's walking on the water, and the Bible says he takes his eyes off the Lord and he sees the waves and the storm, and he begins to sink. We've got to keep our eyes on the Lord, people. We've got to practice the presence of God. In Hebrews 11.28, it says, By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Now, the institution of the Passover was an act of faith. It was kind of similar to Noah's building that ark. Okay? People, it's never rain. God says, build a boat. It's going to rain. What's rain? He builds it. And here Moses is instituting, getting ready to do the Passover without any fear of, the, of Pharaoh. He went ahead, he made the preparations for abandoning Egypt and the Passover is the first step. Now, nothing but faith could avail here. Everything was opposed to human understanding and human reasoning. None of the nine plagues had worked so far. Pharaoh just keeps hardening his heart. Nothing but a strong faith in God could enable Moses to go to the people to give them details about the Passover. What if the blood of the lamb was ineffective in protecting the firstborn from death? And all the Israelites firstborn also died. Then what happens to Moses? By faith, Moses explained to the children of Israel the details of the Passover. It says, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do so, were drowned. Now it says the people here. By faith, the people. I believe that it's Moses' faith that's in view here. It's not the people's faith. In Hebrews 3.16, it says, they came out of Egypt by Moses. 1 Corinthians 10.2 says, they were identified with Moses and by reason of his faith secured their deliverance. So just as Noah's faith saved his family, I think it's Moses' faith here that's saving Israel. It says, and Yah Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel we're going out to finally. So they left. 
they just, well, okay, we're going to go. Let's do the Passover. We're leaving Egypt. The Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and he overtook them and camped at the sea by Piahiroth, Baal Zephon. In the front, yeah, in front of Baal Zephon. All right, now here's the situation with that Moses is faced with. On the one side was the impassable mountain range of Baal Zephon. On the other side were the vast sand dunes, which huge desert, you're not going to survive. Behind Israel is the Egyptian army, and in front of them is the Red Sea. Kind of a, between a rock and a hard place. Humanly speaking, they were trapped. And they'd surely be destroyed. And Pharaoh and his army, listen, they all just lost their firstborn sons. So they're really mad. Okay? They're going to kill them. They're, they're in a fury. Look at Israel's response. Exodus 14.10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to Yahweh. And they said to Moses, Is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Think of what this people just went through in Egypt. The plague, the ten plagues that they saw. They have just demonstrated, they have seen a demonstration of the power of God. And now they're like, well, God can't do anything here. He's run out. He's run out. They feared Greatly, it says. What have you done to us, they say, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. In other words, hey, we'll just stay here as slaves. It's great. For if, would it not have better, been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? They still don't trust God. After everything they've seen. Does that remind you of anybody? Like maybe us? How many things has God taken us through and gotten us through and yet so often when a new situation comes, it's like we just can't get through this. God brings us through these circumstances to teach us to trust in Him. I mean, who made the Red Sea? Who made that mountain range? Who made the Egyptians? Who is it that works all things together for good to those who love Him? It is God and it's God alone. And when we get into situations like this, you know, when your world is falling apart, everything seems like there's no hope, that's a good time to sit back and get excited and say, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. How's He going to get us through this? How's He going to resolve this? Look at Moses' response in 14, 13 through 14. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. You've got to stop being afraid, people. Stand firm and see the salvation of Yahweh. Because we're Americans, that's not a good translation. It should be deliverance. We, we take the word salvation and we think it refers to redemption, God saving us from sin. The idea here is deliverance. Deliverance from the army, okay? See the deliverance of Yahweh, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Yahweh will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Here's the crucial moment. Here's the supreme test. Did Moses' heart fail him? Was he now terrified by the wrath of the king? No. Far from it. He calmly and confidently said to the people, Stand still and see the deliverance of Yahweh. That's incredible courage, people. If things didn't work out, the Egyptians were going to kill him or the, they were going to kill Moses. Okay, Someone's going to kill Moses because this is not a good situation. But he's a man of faith. And he felt responsible for all those Israelites. He brought them out. And now if he, they all died in front of him, that'd be horrible. But he never flinched. He trusts God and he said to them, Fear ye not. Isaiah put it this way. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Because he trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh forever. For Yah, Yahweh is an everlasting rock. So Moses tells the children of Israel, Stand still. And when you can do nothing, people, that's what you do. You wait on the Lord. This is a military order and was equal to telling them to stand by and wait till you receive further orders. Just hang on, he said. He says, see the deliverance of God. 
And I'm sure they're really anxious to see some kind of deliverance here. What in the world's going to happen? And in 14, 15 to 22, it says, And Yahweh said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. And he's like, uh, there's a lake in front of us, a sea here. How are we going to get through this? How do we go forward? He says, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh. And all his hosts, his chariots, his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I'm Yahweh when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So remember, they're following this pillar. Now the pillar moves behind the crowd and stands there between them and the Egyptians. It says, coming between the host and Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and darkness. So they can't get through this cloud, cloud of fire. They can't get through it to get to the, the Israelites. It said, lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, I'm sure you've seen plenty of pictures or movies about this, but this Sea parts. And I believe, and there's evidence to prove this, that the wind coming through like that, it gets very cold. And I think these walls of waters went back and actually froze. And so you got this frozen water, walls of frozen water on both sides of them. It said the water congealed. All right. And so they walked through that on dry ground. Now you got to imagine they're just in awe, just walking through, touching it, looking at, you know, look at the fish, just to, you know, like they're at the aquarium or something, you know. And they're amazed. But it, did it take a lot of faith for them to walk through that? Not really, because you got a bunch of guys with swords and spears going to kill you if you don't go through it. So it's like, hey, it's a path, I'm going. I'd rather take my chance there, all right? If the walls collapse, it's probably still better than being cut up with the sword. So they go that route. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And in the morning watch, Yahweh in the pillar of fire and of the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic. So... They're coming through after Israel's already through. They're coming through after them. God throws them into a panic. They start freaking out. He clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. In other words, their wheels are getting jammed up. They're not rolling and they're falling off and the people are freaking out. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for Yahweh fights for them against the Egyptians. It took those guys a while to figure that out. Ten plagues. You didn't figure out God was on their side? And Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared, as the Egyptians fled into it. And Yahweh threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel. They walked on dry ground through the sea and the waters being a wall to them. What in the world? How'd that scripture get in there? It says, And the people feared Yahweh when they believed in Yahweh and his servant Moses. Okay, people, it's about time, isn't it? After all God does, and now they're saying, Okay, they believed in Yahweh. But it didn't last long because in the next chapter they start murmuring against God again. So, we really are Israelites, aren't we? Moses had grown in his faith. He went through quite a lot of those struggles. He's dealing with the Israelites. They keep turning against him, yet he keeps his eyes on God. And believers, what we have to understand, trials. COVID-19 is a trial for so many of us. It's like a Red Sea experience. We can either pass through them victoriously in faith, or they can destroy us. 
Remember, the key to victory in the Christian life is occupation with Christ. Moses endured as seeing Him who is invisible, and so can we. With Moses as our example, let's keep our eyes on Christ through the trials of life. Don't focus on the trials. How are we going to make it tomorrow? Where are we going to get the finances? How are we going to pay our mortgage? Keep your eyes on Christ. Trust Him. Isaiah 26.3 You keep Him in perfect peace. Who? Whose mind is stayed on you. That's where our focus needs to be. Because He trusts in you. You know, if we focus on our problems, it's going to cause fear. It's going to cause panic. But if we keep our mind focused on Yahweh, we'll endure as seeing Him who is invisible. Knowing God's on our side and that He controls everything has got to give us peace. Turn off the news and get in the Word of God. And you'll have peace because your mind will be focused on Him. He's in complete control over every event that's taking place right now. So we just need to trust Him. As we talked about last week, trust His plan because He's got a plan. And it's going to work out. And I think once we get through this experience, we're going to be a lot better off than we were before going through it. But we need to trust Him. Our eyes need to be on Him so we're not consumed with fear. Fear will paralyze us. Fear allows them to control us. We need to stop fearing and start trusting. Let's pray. Father, I thank You, Lord, for Your Word and for the opportunity to look at it. I thank You, Lord, for Your servant Moses. It's hard to imagine what this man went through. Everybody turning against him. Yet he trusted You, Lord, and he continued to keep the people's best interests at heart and to work for them. Lord, I pray we'd use him as an example to learn to trust you, Lord. Father, help us to realize we need to walk in fellowship with you. We need to be spending time in the Word of God, learning, studying, growing. Teach us, Lord, to trust you in every and any situation we experience that we may have peace of mind. Thank you, Father, for your grace to us. We love you. Amen.